Hey you guys! I am losing the will to do disclaimers at the beginning of my videos. It was recently said in a YouTube video by a booktuber that I'm really into right now that um, those who won't be offended by a disclaimer don't need a disclaimer and those who are going to be offended aren't going to stop being offended just because the disclaimer exists or something like that. I'm paraphrasing it a little bit. Good point either way. But considering the topic of this video can be a very touchy subject, especially if it's not examined with a willingness to have a conversation instead of an argument, I feel the need to say the following. This video or the subsequent videos to follow are in no way meant to be an indictment of the viewer or a judgment on said viewer's preferences, life choices, interests, or values. In a perfect world, this would actually be more of an invitation to question what we know and, and make sure that we are like living in our truth, that we are showing up and being advocates for ourselves and getting exactly what we think we are getting out of anything that we spend our time, money, or attention on. I would also like to say that I am aware that with this video and once again, all the videos to follow in this series, that the issues that I discuss are not limited just to women who are born women. I'm aware it also affects some men and there's probably a lot of transgendered people who deal with this as well. And conversely, there are probably lots of women who don't give a tiny rat's ass about any of this. I'm also aware that I can only speak about any of this stuff from a white woman's perspective because there is a whole nother kind of beauty battle going on out there as it pertains to the experience of black women and other women of color. I can't speak to any of that, although I do try to educate myself about it as much as possible. And I would love to have a further conversation about that, but I, I can only speak from like where I'm sitting and what I've experienced so far, but I do not intend to, or I'm not trying to exclude anybody from this conversation, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, just be aware that I will be saying women for ease of use in this talk, but it is not limited to only women and it is not necessarily indicative of the feelings or behaviors of all women. But today's video is the first in a series that I am calling Broken Beauty, where we're going to be examining a lot of things, but to put a finer point on it, we're gonna be talking about the relationship between beauty and money. The symbiotic relationship between beauty and money is definitely not a new subject on my channel whatsoever. So if you're new here, make sure you check the down bar. I will link all types of other videos related to this if you are interested. And if you're not new here, hey, what's up? How's your mom and him? If you wanna catch all the videos in this series, make sure you are subscribed, hit the notification bell, come check me out on Instagram, and definitely come hang out on the Warp Paint podcast. We have resumed recording and we will be doing episodes of deep dives into all of the subjects in this series in the weeks coming up. So I'm aware that there are plenty of other categories that women or men might spend excessive amounts of money, but I'm particularly fascinated with beauty and money simply because for the majority of us, Paying for beauty in the ways that we might have been conditioned to do so is a lot like trading a cow for magic beans. If we examine the assumed benefits of any given product that we purchase against the images and the marketing tactics that are used to sell them to us and compare and contrast the results, you might as well be paying for tuition at Hogwarts for the real world ROI you can actually expect to get. From a very young age, women are encouraged to embrace and to celebrate and to fetishize and covet and fear and worship at the altar of beauty. I hate to always bring things back to this argument, but this is just something that 90, 95% of men are just not doing. It's an entire part of life that they will never experience or know anything about. And for us, it's the norm. Do some men have issues surrounding gender norms and feel pressure in their own way to conform to patriarchal values? Of course. But two things can be true at once and you cannot discredit the multi-billion dollar machine that is designed to manufacture beauty ideals so that insecurity can motivate the buying habits of millions of women spanning generations. Women have a cream, a lotion, a potion, and a powder for every conceivable square inch of their bodies. 
You can get something to make your hair longer and thicker or thinner and less noticeable. To make the skin either more pale or more deep, we buy little wigs to put on our eyelids and a host of products to create tiny little uh, paintings on them. And then there's a myriad of goos and treatments and procedures to kind of make our divine animal right to just age and get older a little less offensive and more graceful. There's tiny little bottles of paint that we use to shellac the dead keratin uh, fibers that grow on the tips of our toes and our fingers. There's procedures that we can do to have things either put in or taken out of our bodies. If that's not enough or not accessible to you, there's entire clothing lines dedicated to firming, slimming, tucking, tightening, lifting, whatever particular part of your body is unacceptable that day. But how often are we really questioning like what the end game here is? Are there clear winners and losers in this game? And how do we even know if we want it? Are we just here to go on a diet pay bills and die. I know that this is personally something that I could spend my entire life thinking about and talking about um, because I can truly see the argument from all sides, which in my opinion makes it all the more worthy of study. It's not black and white, but the shades of gray are exactly what makes this as insidious as it is. We conflate all this stuff with hashtag self care. We call it empowering. We say it gives us confidence. And we've also seen a big rise in the past 10 to 15 years or so of cosmetics companies uh, selling us products by telling us we're beautiful just the way we are. So how can it really ever be fair to besmirch something so central to our feminine expression? Who wins when we attempt to shame women for the ways that they choose to spend their money or present themselves to the world? If it was in fact as simple as good guy versus bad guy, I don't think the beauty of business would be nearly as profitable as it is. The complexities of this argument can definitely be summarized in the idea that if you are a woman and you are in active pursuit of obtaining beauty through any measurable activity, there is a chance that you will be labeled either insecure or conceited slash stuck up slash self-centered. I've always found it fascinating that one objective can have the ability to inspire two such polarizing assumptions. The insecure argument is based around the idea that if you have your lips filled or have your hair dyed or put on makeup, it's because you're hiding yourself, that you feel inadequate and that you can only find self-esteem once you pluck and primp and contour and bronze yourself into a socially acceptable version of yourself and that you don't like what's on the inside. So you change what's on the outside. I kind of find this argument particularly cruel. When we mock insecurity in women and attempt to try to make them feel less than for using in some cases, the only tools that they have that grants them access to acceptance and money or social status, whether intentionally or not, we are only attempting to shame her for seeking such validation in the first place. In my opinion, broad strokes painting a woman as insecure and therefore bad or wrong for being insecure and then mocking her for that insecurity is much more a reflection of the observer's actual internalized issues with this stuff than it ever is about the woman in question. Women who turn to beauty as a form of armor or metaphorical circle of salt are only trying to adapt to a world that demands this of them in order to be worthy or loved. Women's appearances are scrutinized and mocked and celebrated and commoditized in a way that men's simply are not. Is physical beauty in reality the only way that women can have upward mobility or grow financial or social standing in the world? Is it the only way women are doing so? Absolutely not. But in certain socioeconomic situations, it might be the only card some women have to play and you can't argue with results. As we will discuss shortly, 
beauty or attractiveness in certain arenas of life are the main thing that will afford you professional and therefore financial gain. But instead of shaming women for trying to make it work in a world that rewards the exact behavior they display, we need to be having more conversations about this, particularly in the beauty community, if you ask me. I, I think that there needs to be more balance instead of constantly promoting and blindly celebrating the swiftly depreciating asset that is female beauty. We need to be encouraging and really lifting up more qualities in our women and girls than just this. There's gotta be more. And then the conceited argument is kind of just as laughable to me because they're, once again, it's like the antithesis of insecure because in this situation, we are mad when a woman takes action because she isn't confident. But we also take issue when those exact same actions result in her becoming too confident. The idea here to me is that we're just forever trying to pit women against each other and put them in little boxes so that it makes our worldview make a little more sense. And then there's a whole slew of other implications around a woman's physical appearance. Um, another common one is that she's fake, as if the physical attributes you choose to synthetically enhance automatically determine the authenticity of your character. There's an implication that if she doesn't do any of this stuff that she's quote, not like other girls. And then from a patriarchal standpoint, that is seen as a good thing. Like it's okay to be hot, just not if you have to do anything to be that way. Not like other girls, just a passive aggressive attack on traditionally feminine traits, but okay. Then there's the sin of female aging, which I'm also working on a video about, surprising no one, I'm sure. But if you don't believe that aging is a huge part of a woman's identity, I challenge you to take a look at the recent uh, career uptick that Jennifer Lopez is experiencing right now. Miss J Lo has some discernible talents and you can't knock her work ethic, but the majority of conversation around her as of late is how stone cold drop dead amazing she looks at 50. It makes way more headlines than her actual work does. And then there's like all the magazine covers you see at the grocery store, those cheesy shit tabloids, just vilifying, raking women over the coals for not looking great at 50. Like it's some kind of trespass against humanity or something. My point is, when it comes to what we talk about in this video and all the subsequent videos, I get it. I get how sensitive this subject is. I get how most of the time we can't win for losing. I get how lots of us get so caught up and wound up and invested in this. And I also get why some of us don't even question or side eye the benefits of it anymore. But we have to acknowledge the framework of this system before we can even attempt to rebuild it into something that works for us and not against us. And one of the biggest ways that it can consistently work against us is around the subject of money. And just so you guys know that I actually do have some skin in the game and that I'm learning from my own mistakes and that this is in fact a judgment free zone, I'm gonna show you guys my shamey ass beauty budget. Now, I over projected these numbers of course, uh, but not by much. Uh, so for example, with skincare, I haven't had an actual skincare routine that was not prescribed by a doctor in over a year up until lately. So I couldn't tell you um, how long any given product is going to last me. And on top of that, I am using a lot of them. That number, this number in general that we're gonna talk about is also high because a lot of the stuff that I buy is expensive. Uh, but as a whole, this number taught me that I need to trim some shit down <laughs> where I can because this is just nuts. So I started by breaking this down into quarters of the year and then using that figure to get a sense of what I'm doing on a monthly and yearly basis. Uh, for makeup, I really only buy things I replace and I probably replace them or buy more makeup or try more makeup than the average person because of what I do. So I figured that might be roughly $600 a quarter, but that's probably the number out of all of these that's lower, much lower than I'm projecting. So for hair, we have to consider getting my hair done. So you're gonna get my hair done, y'all gonna see this bun a lot because I need a haircut super bad. Um, but yeah, I'm spending roughly $250 a month in hair product. I get my hair done about twice a year. I'm not counting trims in here because I don't really know how often I do that, but twice a year I get it done. That's a cut and a color. And that's about $400 plus, depending on what I'm doing. For skincare, I figured it would be about $500 a quarter. 
Um, for treatment, like Botox, I'm at about $300 a quarter, give or take, depending on how long it lasts. Part of my Botox is actually like a medical thing. I have really bad jaw clenching and TMJ, so I kind of have to have part. Part of the Botox is like necessary, part of it's not. But then filler, which I get once or twice a year, depending, that's about $600. Facials are kind of sporadic, but I do get them. So that's about $150 three times a year or so. Nails are every two to three, usually three weeks, which makes it about $935 a year. And toes, which I do less often, adds another 420 bucks a year or so. And all of these numbers that I'm telling you guys are before I tip anyone for services, which means that on a yearly basis, I'm spending roughly $10,650 a year or on average $887.50 a month. And for the record, I don't know that I've ever actually like walked away or out of a month having spent $887 a month. It's not this like constant bill I'm paying, but it's not impossible apparently for me to run into that <laughs> according to all these figures. And that's not even including clothes or money I spend on health foods or gym and fitness related activities to maintain or develop a socially acceptable BMI. And yes, there are aspects of what I do for a living that kind of encourage that kind of spending. Um, I do my job on camera. If I were a school teacher or a bank teller, I might have a very different relationship with all of this and kind of see things very differently in terms of what is necessary here and what is not. I don't really foresee a future that lends to having that number eliminated completely. And the more money my husband and I make, the less scary that number becomes in proximity. But that doesn't, that doesn't make that number reasonable. <laughs> and there is no harm, no harm in me trying to get that number down when and where I can. Like, slim by Finn and become a drugstore queen, you heard it here first. I wanna read you guys from an article written last year that I will link below. Side note, this entire video is from a script that's on my iPad down here. If you keep catching me looking down, that's why I try to keep my thoughts on track. But yeah, um, this article was written last year. I will link it below. For context, this article is from Australia. Uh, and they believe that women are probably spending closer to 14,000 Australian dollars, which is roughly 9,182 American. Referring to that figure, quote, adhering to contemporary beauty mores could be said to be keeping young women poor or at the very least throwing serious roadblocks into their path towards long-term financial security. Let's say you invested that money in the stock market and achieved net returns of about seven to 8% over time. That could see you with the balance rapidly swelling towards $250,000 over about a decade as the awesome power of compound growth begins to work its magic. Even simply saving around $14,000 per annum and putting it in a term deposit could see you with a six figure nest egg in about six years. The point of this data, once again, is not to shame anyone. The point is that's a lot of money. And while those numbers at first glance might make the spending on beauty and personal grooming seem frivolous, or silly, and once again, there's that immediate judging of female choices, there's some evidence to suggest that even if we chose to be very conservative within our beauty budgets, there's only so much we can do to get away from having them at all. Because not only are women paying more for beauty because it's socially ingrained in us to do so, we also have the pink tax to contend with. Quote, the pink tax refers to the extra amount of money women pay for specific products or services. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as price discrimination or gender pricing. How much more you might be wondering? According to this article that I will link below, as well as the expansive PDF that it got this data from, products for women and girls cost 7% more than comparable products for men and boys. And it breaks it down a little further by saying we're paying 7% more for toys and accessories, 4% more for children's clothing, 8% more for adult clothing, 13% more for personal care products, and 8% more for senior slash home care products. I feel the need to reiterate that when it comes to the products in question here, we're not talking about a luxury product in girl category compared to a bargain product in boy category. The products that they're comparing are basically identical in every way that matters and counts. And then not only that, studies have been shown that while attractiveness does play a role in getting higher salaries for both genders, 
practices such as applying makeup and doing your hair and the styling that you do to your clothing was actually what accounted for nearly all of the salary differences for women of varying attractiveness. For men, grooming did not make as much of a difference. On top of that, certain jobs uh, absolutely can fire you if you do not meet the required grooming standards of your gender. So things like makeup and manicured nails can absolutely be a part of that requirement, which add another expense to women doing the exact same job as a man in that exact same field that they are not required to participate in at all. And we don't get paid more for having to buy into that system. Until recently, a black woman or man could get fired from their job for simply deciding to wear their hair natural because corporate America deemed their natural hair, the way it grows out of their head, as not clean cut enough. An added monthly expense for women and men of color to do the exact same job with no raise in wages whatsoever to account for it. California, I'm reading this from the article, California and New York were the first states to enact laws this past summer forbidding race-based hair discrimination. New Jersey, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Kentucky, as well as Cincinnati, Ohio, and Montgomery County, Maryland have followed with proposed legislation. Good job, guys. So if we're recapping, women are not only paying more for the exact same personal grooming products that men are, but the amount of grooming that they choose to do has significant career consequences over that of a man. The standard of grooming is completely mandatory and entirely up to the discretion, the random discretion of the employer, forcing you to spend money on this in order to earn money at all in ways and places that men do not have to. And most of the time, we're not even paid as much as men for the exact same jobs. So yeah, this is just a snapshot of why the connection between beauty and money is something that fascinates, enrages, and terrifies me. Moving on to beauty debt. On my channel, I have done videos about beauty budgets, how to find out what kind of makeup shopper you actually are, reasons not to buy makeup, lists of makeup and beauty products that you can probably stop spending money on, uh, you name it, if I could figure out a way to talk about this, I did. But one thing that we really haven't spoken about on my channel is the concept of beauty debt, which obviously refers to any amount of debt surrounding procedures or treatments or products in the beauty category. First of all, I think it's fair to say that the relationship that any of us have between debt is going to be very unique to the individual in question. Some people find debt to be a very necessary thing. Some people, uh, find it harmless and some people get very anxious when they even hear the word. And in a lot of cases, debt has some measurable benefits to it. Car and home loans, tuition, big purchases on items that are needed to make your life easier, like a refrigerator or a couch, in my opinion, are realistic and necessary reasons to take on debt. And since your entire credit score is based off of showing lenders how well you manage debt, taking some on is kind of mandatory. But I have begun to wonder how are we feeling about debt surrounding beauty. And if that kind of debt by nature is any better or worse to take on than any other kind of consumer debt. There are myriad ways to rack up beauty debt. And I'm sure we could probably come up with several good reasons to do so. When it comes to things like cosmetic procedures, for example, almost all med spas or cosmetic doctor's offices accept credit card and or give you the option to finance your procedures through a third party lender called Care Credit. The reason that you might pay for a cosmetic procedure at all differs person to person. And I do understand that there is a host of benefits to the self esteem of those who are able to use cosmetic surgery to correct birth defects or other flaws that may have made them feel bad for the majority of their lives. And when we look at it from the vantage point of giving those who have had to deal with scrutiny and poor treatment for something that they can't control, it almost seems cruel for me to even attempt to paint debt from cosmetic procedures as problematic in any way. So for example, I grew up in a household uh, that had almost no money to get even the bare necessities taken care of, let alone pay for things like regular dental visits or braces. Until I got married at 26, I think I had only been to the dentist three or four times my entire life. So getting veneers was like getting access to an entirely new existence that I had been locked out of 
because of my access or lack thereof to money. I spent all of my life up until that point embarrassed of my smile and kind of refusing to do it. I was picked on about my teeth when I was a kid and I have nightmares still all the time about losing my teeth or my old teeth coming back. As I said in the beginning, it is kind of unfair to just completely think women should be able to defy or shirk the idea of access to confidence, acceptance, love, or employment even because of something they had no control over just because someone else might not understand that motivation. And it certainly isn't fair for me to assume that just because they don't have all the money immediately available to them to pay for said cosmetic procedure that they shouldn't have access to getting it at all. But this is where the line comes up. Is there a line between necessary and unnecessary? And when does it become either financially or physically dangerous to cross it. If you are interested in hearing that topic discussed further, then I think you will love the third video in this series coming up where we're gonna talk about dangerous internet famous beauty DIYs and body dysmorphia and the terrifying world of black market plastic surgery. So stay tuned for that. As far as beauty debt surrounding product, I think there are several things here we need to examine as well. Considering the fact that as we discussed in the beginning of the video, that much of what we consider beauty spending also falls under the umbrella of good grooming for women and a lack of participation in that system can limit your access to opportunity. How can we draw a line in the sand of what is reasonable to do and what isn't? Isn't it different for every person in question? And furthermore, what harm is it actually doing? In most circumstances, I would say it's probably not harming the majority of people. However, with the rise of the beauty guru and the beauty community that followed, we have seen such a huge shift in new ways to, to buy makeup, new places to buy it from, and not only that, new ways to be able to buy the makeup without actually having to have the money to do so at all. Sephora and Ulta both have credit cards now, and with the invention and rise of popularity of buy now pay later services like Klarna and Afterpay, anyone, no matter what budget, now has access to lots of the pricey beauty products that maybe once they wouldn't have had the funds for. I've been doing a lot of research on buy now pay later services. As someone who has used them in the past, uh, I'm a little embarrassed I didn't look into this more, but I have found things that I thought were surprising and also not at all. So according to the founder of Afterpay, one of the reasons he started this company was because he said, quote, millennials are more afraid of credit card debt than they are of dying. I don't, I don't know where he's getting that from exactly, but this is just debt rebranded. As I said in the beginning of this segment, it is almost impossible to avoid debt, but if managed responsibly, which comes with experience and discipline, things like credit card debt do have long-term benefits. Paying off credit card debt helps your credit score. Some credit cards have cash back or airline miles, which are very, very helpful depending on your situation. And also the way that we just simply apply for credit cards kind of guarantees we have limited access to money that we cannot pay back. And things like Afterpay don't really teach you better financial habits at all. If anything, <laughs> they embolden you to make riskier financial decisions with little to no long-term benefit. With the exception of allowing you to buy a face cream that is $30 to $50 more expensive than you would normally be able to afford. In fact, Afterpay actually views itself as a budgeting tool, which I guess in some ways it can be seen as such. The only thing is, are you really budgeting for a product once you've already bought it? The benefit of Afterpay and services like it is that you can purchase things exactly when you want or need them without paying any kind of interest. You make four small payments over a short period of time and everyone's happy. In fact, going delinquent on a purchase that you make through Afterpay or Klarna has kind of limited repercussions with the exception of, I think it's like a six to $8 late fee fine. Like there's really no harm, no foul. But I think it would be helpful for you guys to consider why this service exists and who is actually profiting off of it and how they're doing that. Because unlike traditional lending services who stand to make money off of you through things like high interest rates, Afterpay and services like it are not actually making money off of you 
the buyer. They make money from the store that you're buying from. Anytime a product gets into your hands because Afterpay is available to you, that is a huge win for the company. In Afterpay's own marketing material on the B2B side, they state that companies who use Afterpay have reported seeing a 22% increase in sales and a 20 to 30% increase in average order value. And I know when I say that, it's probably like, well, everyone wins, Whitney. What are you mad about? What's important to understand and what I have said in many videos is that companies are not out here doing anything for us. In the case of buy now, pay later, this is just a way to remove the biggest obstacle between a company and your money, which is whether or not you can even afford the product. Their bank accounts grow and 22% faster while yours shrinks 20 to 30% more than it did before you started using Afterpay. And once again, the whole point here is to bring higher priced items to people who previously could not afford it. And not being able to afford something you want sucks, I get it. But instead of looking at the things that you can't afford and learning how to manage money or saving for them or actually budgeting for them or working on your career or learning to shop smarter, Afterpay just hands you a solution, but you still have the problem. Afterpay in particular works overtime to make you think that not only is it a good idea, to spend money you don't have right now, but they also have this way of kind of making you feel like that is your right. It is literally no skin off of Afterpay's ass either way. Did I mention that it's actually very rare for people to use programs like Afterpay that do not already have debt piling up that is yet to be paid off in other areas? I'm also not really a big fan of what to me seems like blatant targeting of women just looking at Afterpay and Klarna's Instagram accounts. Like if you scroll through Afterpay's feed, you will see that 85% of the products that they promote, I'm looking at it on my tablet right now, um, through their program are aimed at women and Klarna has full blown sparkly pink branding going on. Like there's a clear target here and it's us. Like I kind of wish that they would just adopt the slogan, women be shopping and just give up the ghost already. I'm not here to tell you what to do with your money. I just think that we need to be having more conversations around this stuff because if something seems too good to be true, you can bet your sweet ass that it absolutely is. Spending around beauty is something I have been talking about on my channel for a long time, as I said before. But there is a whole other level of insidious behavior surrounding beauty spending that I am making my next video about, which is third party shopping sites and counterfeit makeup, dumpster diving for beauty products, and criminal shoplifting rings that are targeting stores specifically like Ulta and Sephora. We look at things like buy now, pay later, and Ulta credit cards as mostly harmless, but it's just a symptom of this fervent, manic, consumer-driven monster that has made things like makeup and beauty products so heavily valued that people will literally put their entire futures on the line for them. So stay tuned to see how all of this plays out in the series. All right, guys, that's the end of this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. As always, a thank you to all the patrons. I've been having a really hard time in the month of May, so we're a little late on May content this month. I've already talked to my patrons about it. They're amazing. They're so, so freaking cool and nice to me. They totally get it. Uh, but that's also why I wasn't here present on YouTube for a couple of weeks. I just, I needed some time. Like... Honestly, I'm very excited to finish this series. I've been working on it for a long time. It's probably the longest I've worked on any, any video and I want it to be so good, but the subject matter as important as I feel like it is, it's kind of a bummer. And this is all culminating in kind of a discussion I want to have you got, I want to have with you guys about my relationship to the beauty community and the beauty industry. And it's probably going to be a video that is super scary for me to film and make, and I'm going to be completely transparent with you guys. So stay tuned for all of this stuff. I really want to hear all you guys' thoughts on this as well. Please keep it respectful. Like I go out of my way, despite what some people say to not be hateful or mean or aggressive in these videos. I just want to talk about this with you guys because I care about how this is affecting all of us. So yeah, anyway, I hope you guys are having an amazing day. Once again, don't forget to come check out the War Paint podcast. Everything is linked down below. Thumbs up the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I will catch you in the next one. Have a great day.
拜。